I woke up this morning and the first thing on my mind was Elizabeth. Elizabeth I, Queen Elizabeth of England. I thought about her in multiple ways, as one does, but I especially ruminated about her wardrobe. So for no rhyme or reason, that's what we're gonna talk about today, because I want to. Elizabeth I, her life, her times, and her clothes. My name is Teresa, and this is Elizabethan Fashion. So what was going down during Elizabeth's reign between 1583 and 1603? Well, a lot of drama, assassinations, massacres, political maneuverings, and an entire armada fell. England at the time was racked by turmoil, both at home and abroad. The Catholics versus Protestants. We began in 1517 in Germany, when Martin Luther, this guy, priest, scholar, man of page boy hair, Cut. He was not happy with the Catholic Church. He accused the Catholic Church of corruption. They were robbing the commoners blind. He wasn't keen on the exclusivity of only priests reading the words of God. He wanted to take religion back to the common man. And he was also very unhappy with the many, many rituals of a Catholic service. Stained glass windows, gold, the standing, the sitting, the standing again, more sitting, Lots of idols, statues. One thing I noticed about Catholics, they like a good statue. My favorite statue is the ecstasy of St. Teresa, whom I was named after. I'm not Catholic, by the way, but my dad did say I was named after a saint. It was either St. Teresa or Mother Teresa, or maybe both. Martin Luther didn't like gold. He thought it was gaudy, unnecessary. He was the minimalist of Christianity. So on October 31st, 1517, the Catholic Church's most vocal critic nailed his 95 theses on the door of his hometown church in Germany. And that was unofficially the beginning of a cataclysmic break with the Catholic Church. Beginning of Protestantism. So what does this have to do with England? You've heard of Henry VIII, Elizabeth's father, King of England, man of many wives. Just to show off, I'm gonna list his multiple wives from memory. Catherine of Aragon, Princess of Spain, Anne Boleyn, Jane Seymour, Anne of Cleves, Catherine Howard, Catherine Parr. I have watched so many adaptations of Elizabeth, Henry VIII, Tudor associated movies. I might as well be a 60 year old woman. Henry VIII, King of England, in his quest for a male heir and in his quest for complete autonomy, absolute power of kings. Louis XIV of France adopted this power. The king was a direct channel from God. There is nobody between the king and God. Why was the Catholic Church getting in the way between the king and God? Henry VIII believed this, and many say that he broke with the Catholic Church to become the head of the Church of England because he wanted to divorce his current wife, Catherine of Aragon, for Anne Boleyn, Elizabeth's mother, and the Catholic Church did not approve of divorces, especially divorces amongst monarchs. But I think he divorced his wife and broke with the Catholic Church to do his own thing. He wanted to cut out the middleman. He didn't want anybody telling him he can't do anything. So he started his own church, Church of England. I'm sure he loved Anne Boleyn until she was unable to provide him with a male heir. And then she got a little naggy, a little suspicious of his flirtations with her lady-in-waiting, Jane Seymour, who became his third wife. Her inability to give him a male heir kind of soured his relationship. It was all about his legacy, his dynasty, and Henry VIII didn't like to be told what to do, especially by the Pope. So he went his own way. As Bon Jovi said, it's his life. He was going to do it his way. Life is like a broken highway or in that time, a broken dirt road, and he was going to do it his way. He's not gonna live another another lie because it's his life. What does Bon Jovi have to do with Tudors? That's why you come here for these cultural connections, right? So for all the work Henry VIII went through and all the wives he went through to produce a male heir, he did father a male heir, Edward the Sixth. His son did not live very long. His only heirs, Mary and Elizabeth. Mary became queen, Queen Mary. She was married to Philip the 
something of Spain. And Mary kicked the bucket after really embracing Catholicism and burning a lot of heretic Protestants at the stake. They called her Bloody Mary. Her term was not long lived. And then Elizabeth ascended the throne. Her legitimacy was questioned because her father did behead her mother for trumped up charges of infidelity. So there we have it. Elizabeth and her very messy ascent to the English throne. The turmoil during her reign, the many decades long religious battle between Catholics and Protestants, her tenuous grasp on the throne was also challenged by rival countries, Spain. France was no friend of England. I'm sure the many principalities of the Holy Roman Empire was also cheering for her downfall. And the Pope was also no friend of Elizabeth. Many foreign princes wanted to marry Elizabeth. They wanted this alliance, but Elizabeth not to be dominated by a husband and having seen what marriage did to her mother, refused to marry, which is why she is known as the Virgin Queen. Elizabethan society was dictated by sumptuary laws. Those are laws that dictated which social class could wear what. If you were part of the aristocratic class, then you can wear more elaborate, luxurious fabrics, such as silk, brocade, taffeta. If you were unfortunately born a peasant, then you were not allowed to dress above your station. You wore simple, natural materials, wool, cotton, leather. The working class were often seen in yellows, blues, greens, and oranges, whereas the queen herself wore deep reds and purples. Reds and purples were notoriously difficult to come by. In order to obtain purple dye, you basically had to collect a bunch of sea snails, grind them down to extract that purple color. Yellows came came from the most abundant of resources, your pee. So let's put together the Elizabethan woman's silhouette. Everybody wore a corset. That was just the thing you do because they wanted you to have a very triangular busk a fuller skirt bottom, and we want the stomach to come in as a V. To achieve the shape, we have a bum roll right on your lower back, and then we have a farthingale, which goes under your clothes to help your dress achieve its desired shape and to enlarge the bottom half of your body. The gown was open at the front, so then you would need an additional stomacher to complete the look. It's easier to put together your outfit in pieces, therefore making it easier to launder. And people didn't launder all the time. That was also a social class divide as well. The rich had the ability to have multiple pieces of clothing and they were able to launder and keep clean a lot easier than the poor. I'm fairly certain everybody living in the past smelled like sheep. The rich smelled unpleasant as well. Speaking of laundry, the quintessential look of the Elizabethan era was the snowy white ruff. Not just an accessory, it's a necessitated accessory. And if you were rich, then you would launder this rough, it would be the starchiest and the stiffest and the scratchiest thing. But damn it, you would wear it because the queen wore it and you wore whatever the queen wanted you to wear. You wanted to look like the queen. She was England's only influencer. Whatever she wore, the ladies at court wore. And the ladies who weren't at court saw the ladies at court and wanted to wear that too. So basically all the ladies had that same silhouette. We don't want heaving bosoms here. We want to suppress the bosom. We want a flat, slender, chess. As for ladies hair, it was peak Disney villainous hair. Elizabeth had curly hair, so everybody else wanted curly hair as well. They curled their hair with tongs. They dyed their hair with henna. Their hair would be wrapped up in a net, a bejeweled embroidered net. Or they would place a jaunty cap on their head as if they were going out riding. Elizabeth had a bad brush with smallpox, leaving her with thinning hair with bald patches in the later part of her life. She was a style icon when she wore a wig, the courtiers wore wigs. When she bejeweled her hair, they bejeweled their hair. When she did a heart-shaped hairdo, the Elizabethan taco hairstyle, the courtiers did too. A big forehead, a sign of beauty, good breeding, a sign of aristocracy. In that sense, I have a, a big giant forehead, so I would have fit in right there. I mean, I probably wouldn't fit in because I was Asian and I don't know if, if anybody in Elizabethan England has ever seen an Asian. They would have looked at my forehead. Ooh, 
I want to put that head on a coin. Men wore their hair a little longer. It was shorter, but not that short. Not exactly a mullet, but they liked the curly hair. I wonder if you were a man back then with straight hair, if, if you curled your hair, if you took those iron tongs to your head. The beard of choice was a pointy goatee, the mustache goatee thing. It was not a straggly, sloppy beard. It was a groomed, pointy, pointy beard. Earrings were a big thing. And also the single earring, a pearl earring. So Elizabethan men, they were kind of like rocking that K-pop look the dangly earring, but with a pearl. The pearl was the thing to catch the eye of the queen. The triangular waist was the silhouette of the moment in Elizabethan England. Everybody, even men, wanted to look like the queens. They had a bust. It wasn't exactly a corset, but it definitely was a thing that went over your puffy linen undershirt, draw you in at the waist. For your bust, you had your doublet, then you had your jerkins, and then you had your puffy balloon stocks, balloon shorts, then you have your tights, your stockings. Like the men did not skip leg day. The stocks, the tights showed off your nice legs, fine legs. At this time, men lost their cod pieces. Balloon shorts kind of took away from that tight crotch area. The torso still pointed, you sent your eye in a V down to the the thing. I don't have a comment about that. Everybody had puffy shirts at this point, but having clean white linens, a sign of privilege. So that is why the trend of a slash and puff was a thing because the sleeves were detachable. People like to pluck out the undershirt so you can see the puffy under things. So it was quite a trend to give everyone a peekaboo of your under things, of your shift, of your chemise. It was also a matter of pride to show exactly how white you can launder your under things. It was very important for the aristocrats to have this snowy white. Let's talk about capes. Aristocratic men had a short, jaunty cape. I feel like everything in the Elizabethan time was very jaunty, no doubt. Elizabeth I in her later years probably felt bad about her face. I mean, she was rich enough to afford a mirror to look at herself in. There's only one shade of foundation in the Elizabethan age that was alabaster, that was white. She wore makeup to separate herself from your ordinary woman, ordinary man. She was a symbol, she was untouchable. And she caked that stuff on. It was called Venetian ceruse. Because it was lead base, it destroyed your skin got into your blood, made you sick, made you lose your teeth. You slapped it on to cover up blemishes. It created more blemishes, created sores, wrecked your face. Because of that, you have to cake on more makeup. So Elizabeth, her skin had been scarred up by smallpox in 1562, leaving her half bald, dependent upon wigs and cosmetics. Because only the wealthy could indulge in sweets and sugar, she had quite the sweet tooth. By the end of her life, she lost most of her teeth. The ambassador to France noted that her teeth were very yellow, missing mostly on the left side, making her speech very hard to understand. She was kind of talking we were kind of talking like this. Sir Walter Raleigh described her as a lady whom time had surprised. A quintessential British passive aggressive comment. A lady whom time had surprised. I don't really think this does anything to tamper down my baby hairs, but I find it very soothing. You know what else I find soothing? When you take your finger, stroke your fulcrum right here, I find this also very soothing. This could literally hypnotize me and put me to sleep. That's it. I don't want to speak anymore. Goodbye.